Stocks trade soft, but there's no sell-off despite a sharp fall in US indices overnight. Financials and metals are the big drags, even as energy and utilities eke out gains. Axis Bank slumps on reporting a weak performance with growth slowing in advances and deposits, profitability taking a knock and slippages seeing a sharp rise. Return ratios too are the lowest in five quarters. LNT manages to beat expectations despite the elections, heat wave and labour shortage issues hurting execution. While the order book accretion remains healthy, the pipeline sees a trim, the stock perks up. SEBI study spanning 86% of retail client accounts in the cash segment reveals that 7 out of 10 intraday traders incur losses with those aged under 30 years faring worse. What's more, despite this, the number of intraday traders have grown 300% in FY23 in a worrying sign. CNBC TV 18's town hall with the secretaries from the finance ministry sees some key revelations. The 12.5% LTCG tax rate won't change. Withdrawal of indexation on realty won't be reversed. STT on FNO is only a small nudge to curb speculation. Hello and welcome to Half Time Report. Uh, I'm Ekta Batran. With me is Mangalam Malu. Well, it's turning out to be a session which is better than expected considering that we were bracing ourselves for a rough day after the US close that we saw overnight. But uh, nonetheless, we seem to be singing our own tune at this point in time and we have recovered from the day's low for the Nifty as well as the Sensex. So good going. As of now, the mid-cap index is just about lower by around 60-odd points. Bank Nifty lower by around 1-odd percent. But it seems to be earnings and more earnings which continue to be in focus. So we have Axis Bank and LNT which are reacting to numbers. But uh, today we do have good numbers coming in from the likes of Adani Green, Ashok Leyland, TechM. So that would be important to focus on. And remember, the next couple of days is going to be heavy in terms of numbers uh, because we do have Indusind Bank tomorrow. Then we have ICICI Bank, which comes out with numbers on Saturday as well. So it's going to be uh, definitely a lot of action uh, the next couple of days. Hi, Manglam. Hi, Ekta. A lot of action indeed. But the good part is that we've recovered from lows, telling you the inherent strength of the market. You know, ahead of expiry today, the option writers were positioned between 24 250 on the Nifty at the lower end to 24 500 on the upper end as well. Now, as we speak, the Nifty's managed to stay afloat a little above the 20 day moving average for that frontline index as well. What happens from here on depends on a couple of factors. One, what the IT index does given the overall weakness that we've seen in the NASDAQ overnight. And secondly, the Nifty Bank. That has been a bit of a problem pocket for the market. So there's been a smidge of a recovery on the IT index, still under pressure. The Nifty Bank, that too, while it has recovered, it's still down about a percent, led lower, of course, by Axis Bank. But we have heavyweights like uh, HDFC Bank and Kotak Mahindra Bank moving off lows, putting some support on the way the Nifty Bank has moved as well. The mid-cap index, outperformed in yesterday's trading session, continues its outperformance today as well. And for a brief period, it did move into the green as well. You spoke about earnings. I'm looking at Nestle, which has now moved to the low point of trade. This time around, the results were weak. There were growth headwinds ahead. The domestic business grew just by about 4%. There were, you know, concerns with regards to volume growth as well. And more importantly, you know, everyone's looking at rural recovery as a play on the FMCG sector. But Nestle gets 75% of its revenues from urban India, so may not be as big a beneficiary of rural recovery as its other peers. So that stock at the low point of trade. Okay, Nestle is in focus in today's trading session. So that stock down around 2.6%. But let's get talking about a couple of companies then. Ramkrishna Forgings is the first management on the show. The company reported what was a weak set of Q1 numbers. There was slower growth led by weakness, especially in the domestic market. To discuss this, we have Naresh Jalan, who's the MD of the company now joining in. Mr. Jalan, thank you very much for taking the time out. Well, yes, it's definitely been a slow quarter for you all where the revenue growth has only been around 4-odd percent. If you could just tell us what exactly the growth in the domestic market was this quarter and what was the reason for the weaker than estimated numbers? I think we have done well in uh, this quarter considering all the circumstances related to elections and the heat wave. So there was a domestic uh, off-take slowdown as well as because of the weather and other things. Uh, we had experienced a slowdown, but while well, you see the export, we have done considerably well. So overall, in terms of our Q1 numbers, we are very satisfied with the numbers. All right, so let's talk about uh, FI25 then. You're satisfied with these numbers. What is the kind of tonnage that you are expecting in terms of growth for the FI25 uh, financial year? At the same time, 
uh, the peak revenue that can come in from the JMT plant in FY25 and thereafter as it increases its utilization. Along with the AICL acquisition, you had said that this business could be close to around 500 crores by FY26. So what are your targets for FY25 for that one? Tonnage uh, and, uh, you know, the revenue from JMT and AIC. I think uh, in this year, we are looking at almost 15% plus volume growth in our case and on a standalone basis. And we are on track with the current order wins and with the strong order pipelines, both in exports and the domestic. We are expected to do better than 15% in terms of overall volume growth for the full year. And in terms of GMT, we are looking at almost 100 plus crores in this year. And in from ACL also, we are looking at almost 125 to 130 crores uh, this year. And we are on track on both the companies, all the both op operations have considerably taken traction. All the customers are back. But in terms of approvals and other things which are taking time, but we are still on track for FR FI26 guidance to meet expectations. Okay. Uh, give us a sense in terms of what you are estimating, at least in terms of uh, your margins because your earlier guidance was around 23% odd. Um, you've done 21% this quarter. I, what are the challenges that you're probably facing on the operational front? Do you think that you can scale or stick to that guidance of 23%? No, I think we are on 23% plus margins. Also, if you see our presentation, so it is 23% plus margins we have maintained this quarter also, which is a one-off expenses of 17.5 crores, which has led to our uh, margins as 21%, uh, but one of expenses, if you remove that, we are at 23.1% margins. All right. Could you give us a sense of, uh, you know, the kind of tonnage that you will have in both domestic and exports this year? You've overall on a company basis given a guidance of upwards of 15%. If you could break that down for us for both your domestic and exports business. We, con uh, Mangalam, we uh, continue to drive volume 60, 40 is and uh, of 640 hmm. plus in terms of exports. And I think in terms of tonnage also, we'll stick to that only. But uh, realization being better in exports. So in terms of tonnage, I think it is very difficult for us to define. But in overall terms of revenue, uh, we are very confident we'll be able to maintain our exports will be better than what uh, domestic market happens for us. Okay. Well, a couple of months ago, uh, you know, one of your uh, orders were actually put on hold, we understand. Um, you know, the approval to supply powertrain components uh, to one of the largest EV players in the US. Uh, any update with regards to that? Um, you know, any kind of rebidding or uh, uh, contracts for the order which could come up again? I think we have given our statement in terms of our order wins in the presentation. And uh, these are all business on ongoing basis. So obviously, uh, anything on hold comes back also to business. So we have no specific uh, replies to those queries. But in terms, I can tell you that in terms of exports, we are gaining market share as well as new businesses from new customers also. So And we are on track to achieve our export uh, growth. If you could reiterate uh, your order book for uh, the viewers here, what was the order inflow during this quarter? What is it that you're anticipating in terms of further orders in the remainder of this year? I think this quarter we have almost have had an order, uh, new order of inflow of almost 1600 crores to be supplied over the next four years, uh, including 280 crores almost for from railways, which is a contractual, I think that that's not for four years, that, that is an ongoing basis. So, taken together, all, uh, close to 600 plus crores of orders we have received in this quarter. All right. And this run rate is likely to continue over the next couple of quarters. What's your outlook for the remainder of this year? Yes, I think this run rate is going to continue. We are extremely confident with the kind of uh, inflow of RFQs and other things are there from different geographies. And our penetration into new geographies, which are also being worked out, I think we are very confident to continue getting our new orders and new traction from new customers. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Jalan, we're going to leave it on that note. Uh, thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that's the view coming in uh, from Ram Krishna Forgings. That stock is down around a percent and a half. Revenue growth was only around 4 odd percent this quarter. Margins at around 21 percent. But they are confident about their growth going into FY23, the remaining part of the fiscal. We'll take a break now. We'll put the focus on FNO um, at midday. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. We're talking about the markets recovering from the lows, but still not out of the woods yet. Down 60 points for the Nifty, 500 points for the Nifty Bank. Important to look at the market in the second half of trade, largely because the July series expiry will play out. And in that, the Nifty is just hovering around that 20-day moving average of 24,347. So Nifty is around 24,350 thereabouts. And the 20-day moving average that should come up for you on the screen is at 24,347 itself. So that's about, uh, you know, the market set up at midday. It's the July series expiry today. It's expected to be volatile, and that's reflected in the way the India VIX has panned out as well. So the India VIX is actually up 9% right now at the high point of trade. So the intraday chart of that comes up for you on the screen as well, uh, closing in towards that 12.9 mark. Remember, on budget day, just before that, it was close around 14, 14 and a half. So it had seen a bit of a cool off post the event. And from there, we've seen a bit of an up move. Nifty's low today was 24,210. And that will be an important line to watch out for, at least for today's trading session. The mid-cap index has recovered a little faster. The Nifty Bank, we're talking about that, right? So if you look at the contribution chart of the Nifty Bank, it's largely led lower by Axis Bank. Let's see whether the other large heavyweights, uh, HDFC Bank and Kotak Bank, uh, you know, play any part in the recovery of that. But as things stand right now, the way the street is positioned, 24,300 put on the Nifty is very active. And on the way up, we have the 24,400 call. That is active too. So that's about, uh, you know, the contribution for the Nifty Bank. The 24,300 put active, telling you 24,250 thereabouts. Closer to today's low, we would see support. But on the way up, 24,450 thereabouts, could see some bit of resistance as well. So those are a couple of factors that we'll watch out for for expiry today. Okay, all right, Mangalam. Uh, well, that's on uh, the entire FNO space ahead of expiry today. We'll take a short break, but up next, we'll connect it, connect with Jonathan Hunt, who's the MD and CEO of Sinjin, to decode their Q1 numbers. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, let's get talking to a couple of other companies. Sinjin reported what was a weak set of Q1 numbers. The margin uh, was lower. The EBITDA was lower as well on a year-on-year -year basis. To decode this, we have Jonathan Hunt, who's the MD and CEO of Sinjin, who's joining in. Mr. Hunt, thank you very much for taking the time out. Uh, you know, I wanted to start by asking you not about the margins, but about the U.S. biotech business, because you have indicated that there are continued challenges within that space at this point in time. Uh, but last quarter, I remember you had said that there are some kind of green shoots of recovery. So um, what is the situation now? Has that not panned out as per expectations? Is there still a funding challenge uh, which has impacted one of your verticals this quarter? Oh, yeah, super question. Um, I, I go, take a step back. If you have a look, the U.S. biotech sector, uh, particularly where it's funded by sort of uh, venture capital, private equity capital coming into it, has had a really tough 18 months or so. It had boomed over the last decade uh, and running into the pandemic, then accelerated even more during the pandemic. So during the pandemic years, we were having double the normal flow of capital going into U.S. biotech. Um, and then as we came out of the pandemic, it dipped. It went to a much lower level, I think, as the rest of the global economy uh, reawakened and opened up, and therefore capital had more choices to go to. What I was trying to in indicate last uh, quarter, and actually during the second half of last year, is we were starting to see a rebound and a rebuilding of new capital flows into U.S. biotech. So this is around uh, biotech companies in the U.S. ability to raise new uh, venture capital, new funding to drive their science forward. And what we saw in the last quarter was that's back at pre-pandemic levels. Numbers I saw were about 23 billion U.S. dollars of new investment going into the biotech sector. And that's a positive, healthy indicator for companies like us, because as they raise new capital, they then take a time to decide how they're going to deploy it, the sort of experiments that they're going to do. And then that starts to drive a pickup in demand. And that really is the, the, the sort of macro background trend hmm. to the guidance given the Sinjin shape of the year. We, we said it, we would think it was going to be flattish revenue growth in the first half, both quarter one and quarter two. And then we expected to see a strong pickup towards the uh, end of the year and in the second half. As that new capital that's being raised now 
in the US starts to be spent and starts to create demand in the services industry in the second half of the year. So I think for me, at least the story of our quarter is as expected. It was a soft quarter, but we predicted it. And it's in line with our thesis that we think there's some very positive longer term indicators and they indicate good growth in the second half of the year. All right. So that, uh, you know, so should one assume that there is no change to the guidance that you've given as expected was the first quarter? No problems with, uh, you know, the margins and uh, even the revenue growth that you have for the entire year. The first half, Correct. of course, understandably weak, right? Yeah, absolutely. If anything, I mean, it, it, a soft quarter, but it does tell us at least our understanding of what's going on in the broader market. What's happening in demand was accurate. We predicted it in line with the analyst expectations. That means the market understood that this was the shape of the quarter to expect in the first, you know, the first quarter and the first half of the year. Um, and so no change to guidance. We, we think we'll return to growth in the second half. We think we'll grow overall on revenue for the full year. We think the margins will now start to come uh, back up. We've given guidance in uh, you know, EBITDA margins similar to last year's on a full mm. year basis. So you start to see that operating leverage come back into the business sequentially through the year. And if you do a triangulation, it must mean quite a robust second half of the year when it uh, okay. comes to but but uh, Mr. Hunt, won't the margin climb be a uh, be quite an uphill task three quarters to get to the FI twenty four odd levels because you are at around twenty one percent on a reported basis this quarter, and that yeah. was the key disappointment this time round uh, because last quarter was around thirty percent plus in terms of margins. Uh, so how how do you expect the margin trajectory? To pan out in three quarters for you to get to those levels? I, I, I think it's implicit in the guidance. We think, you know, on a full year basis, we'll be back up in the high 20s at the EBITDA level. Uh, we think profit will grow single digits. And we think that uh, on a full year basis, revenue will grow high single digits to uh, low double digits. And after that, it's just math. You can triangulate from where we are to achieve that full year performance predicts for sequential improvement in those margins and a recovery in the second half. Uh, it it looks like the street is actually putting in that math because, you know, as you stick to your guidance, even as, you know, there was a soft first quarter, uh, the street was worried whether you would, you know, scale down that, uh, scale down on that guidance or not. But now that you're confident, maybe we're seeing a bit of an uptick on the stock price as well. So soft quarter, no worries, the next couple of quarters would see some recovery. What about the other two verticals? I mean, dedicated centers and uh, the biologics manufacturing. How has business been out there and what's your prognosis here? Yeah, it's good. I mean, the dedicated centers is, you know, very solid. We've got 27 years of a relationship with uh, one of our dedicated centers. So things don't change very much on a quarter on quarter basis. So very happy with what was a solid performance in the dedicated centers. Uh, and I think the biologic CDMO part uh, of the business has been a super success. If you look at where we've come over uh, the last five years from being a pretty much a new entrant in biologic CDMO, we're now in sort of version two, avatar two of that, that, that sort of organization's life with the acquisition we did last year uh, of a, a plant from Stellus. We're in investing and upgrading. We're getting that qualified. It's all on track. So that will mm. become operational towards the end of this financial year. And that's the point we can take it to the market, start showing it to customers and start the sales process. But it, it gives us super headroom for growth, which was really the strategic problem. We would run out of capacity. We'd sold everything that we had uh, installed and therefore we were in danger that we would have to turn clients away. By making that decision to acquire rather than to build, we bring forward the capacity by a couple of years. And uh, once once the sort of upgrading and the qualifications finished, back out into the market becomes a, a sales opportunity. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the U.S. business uh, because, you know, you do, besides the biotech funding piece, you also have the U.S. elections and the possibility of a biosecure act which could come into play. Uh, what is your sense in terms of how much of an opportunity that is presenting to be? Because uh, you have indicated that you all are seeing queries uh, when it comes to the China plus one factor. Has that culminated into anything tangible and what can we expect? Is there any 
also is there any risk to uh, to the business from the US elections? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I actually think the issue is more fundamental than just a piece of US legislation. By the way, the Biosecure Act had uh, bipartisan support, so it, almost to some extent, depending on which party wins the next election, they both indicated so far that they support that direction of travel. But I think the learning is a bit deeper. You have to go back to the pandemic and just look at uh, how people re-examine their supply chains. So it's not particularly uh, an issue just of one geography uh, being the issue. It's about over-reliance on any particular element of your supply chain. If you have all your eggs in one basket, you have a resilience issue. So I think the opportunity for us as a company, and I think more broadly for India um, uh, as a destination for this work, is that those lessons, the pandemic, plus the, the geopolitics, geopolitics that are enshrined in the Biosecure Act, are prompting uh, our clients around the world to think very deeply about do they have too much reliance or too much exposure to any one particular region of the world? Now, there are some super firms in China that really do do good science and good service. But if, all you, all, if everything's in one place, you don't have that resilience. So what we've seen so far this year is a real step up in the number of client audit teams, of client visits, where they're just coming to see what we've got to offer. Uh, right. And they're giving... And that's, turn, that's turning into pilot projects, which is really, I think, the theme for us and most of the Indian CRO, CDMO industry this year, testing particular services, and that then sure. if can scale up. All right, uh, Jonathan, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that is Sinjin sticking to their 525 guidance, and that's probably what the street likes. Stock is up around 3 odd percent. We'll take a short break. More on the markets. Uh, we'll also speak to uh, IGL to decode their Q1 numbers. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, IGL reported what was a good set of Q1 numbers coming in above street estimates and a margin surprise as well to discuss uh, the company's Q1 performance. Our colleague Sonal Bhutra did catch up with Kamal Kishore Chatwal, uh, who's the MD, and began by asking about the margin expansion and the company's sourcing mix. Listen in. Actually, the margin improvement has been due to two reasons. One is the lower gas cost and the second is the improvement in operational efficiency. So as far as the gas cost is concerned, uh, we were able to contract some volumes when the spot prices, a marginal window was there where, you know, the gas spot prices have come down to eight to nine dollars per MMBTU. So we were able to utilize that opportunity to contract some volumes. So that has been the reason. In addition to that, the Henry Hub linked contracts have been more favorable as compared to the crude link contracts. So, uh, and we have around 50 to 60% linked to Henry Hub. So that has been the reason. And the operational efficiency part uh, is a permanent uh, improvement. So that we expect it to continue to the other quarters also, as well. Okay. So give us a sense of your outlook. Now that you're saying 50 to 60% volumes are contracted by Henry Hub, what is the current gas pricing for you when you are using that as an input? How much from, say, uh, domestic gas allocation, how much is imported? And what is the outlook going forward? Your EBITDA per SCM has improved uh, in this quarter versus the last and the one before that as well. What is the target for FY25? You see, the, our guidance has always been that 7 to 8 uh, EBITDA uh, per SCM of 7 to 8 rupees. So we were able to maintain that. Uh, last quarter we were at 6.58. And despite the uh, price cut of 2.5 uh, rupees per kg, we were able to maintain around 7.6. 
so that is uh, one thing that uh, we will be able to maintain because in the last end of the quarter uh, in june last week we were we increased the prices uh, again by 1 rupee just due to the cut in apm allocation so apm currently is at 62% 38% is rlng and we expect apm to remain in this range only 60 to 62% maybe if one or two plants shut down then uh, we see slight increase and then again come back to these levels so 60 to 62 percent would be the range that we expect for the entire year and uh, 38 to 40 percent would be uh, uh, contracted and since our volume are significant i mean the rlng volumes is significant now so we have some flexibility that we can uh, rather than depending on some uh, big players so we can ourselves contract some volumes okay that is so good to know working towards that okay so let's talk about volumes take it forward 8.564 uh, mmscmd in this quarter you had earlier indicated that fi25 exit run rate could be nine and a half is that something that you'll be able to achieve there have been a lot of new avenues right bajaj auto launching that new cng bike i know largely it's in maharashtra right now but do you think there are segments where you can see growth opportunities and reach your uh, targeted mark yes that is one very significant positive for us that uh, uh, the uh, two-wheeler that was one segment where CNG vehicles were not there. I mean, CNG market is, uh, I mean, if you look at the big players, it is around 25 to 30 years old. And two-wheeler was still uh, something that was uh, not there. Uh, CNG vehicles were not there. Now, with the launch of Bajaj, and uh, we see the numbers that it's around 30,000 in, say, 2025 days. And uh, it is being launched in Delhi market in end of July. And maybe the deliveries in... Uh, other two weeks so in the second quarter we see significant volumes of two wheelers uh, entering the uh, ncr and delhi market and since this is the biggest market for two wheelers so we expect around 30 percent uh, 25 to 30 percent uh, sales volume to come from here and if we look at the target of uh, bajaj and the other two wheelers i think tvs has also announced that they are bringing out a cng variant and uh, so we expect significant volumes going forward to come from two-wheeler segment. Mm. Given the fact that uh, in NCR, there is a lot of commute and people say, for example, Greater Noida to Delhi, and everyday commute is more, and uh, the price, uh, that uh, advantage that it gives, the economic advantage of one rupee per kilometer as compared to two, two and a mm. half rupees uh, petrol, that's a significant for, uh, you know, middle class, lower middle class, or the two-wheeler segment. So that we expect that it will be able to compete even with electric. So 9.5 MMSCMD, is that the target that remains for volumes in FI25? Yes, that remains. And uh, because uh, the industrial and commercial segment, we are in discussion with a few players and uh, because they are big volumes. And uh, we expect them to conclude in the second quarter. And we are doing some uh, price tweaking also to make it competitive. So those volumes will come up. In addition to that, one more fact I want to share is that uh, outside Delhi, you know, Delhi there is a pressure of DTC bulk volumes going off roads and we are still absorbing that impact. So whatever increase is there in the passenger vehicle segment, so that is absorbing the loss of DTC. But outside of Delhi, if we look at the GS, the CNG market is growing at around 22%. And overall, CNG PNG market is growing at around 16%. So that is the growth in outside Delhi market, including uh, Noida, Greater Noida, Ghaziabad, uh, Burgaon. Okay. So okay. That, uh, we expect it to continue. Last question before I let you go. You spoke about uh, geographies outside Delhi and NCR doing really well. Uh, what kind of expansion plans do you have in FY25 and FY26? How many CNG stations will you be adding? And in terms of industrial volumes, what kind of growth are you expecting there going forward? You see, current, uh, we, our target is uh, CNG station. If you see, we, we expect to continue the same numbers, 80 to 90 we did last year. So the same is the target for this year. We will be setting up 90 CNG stations uh, and uh, 3,27,000 uh, domestic connections and 2,000 uh, industrial and commercial connections. So that is our target. Similar to last uh, the, uh, uh, the year gone by, so the targets are similar. And... Uh, it will be the same uh, numbers going forward. And industrial volumes, you know, we are currently at around 0.8 million. Mm. And uh, we expect that uh, 30 to 40% growth this year in that segment.
All right, that is about IGL, uh, the stock lower, but that was management commentary. As we slip into a short break, just keep an eye out on the markets. There has been a formidable recovery, and as we pointed out, it's led by the IT index. So the Nifty IT index, which was showing a bit of a recovery, uh, you know, just as we started the show, has now moved into the green, just about moved into the green. So the IT index comes up for you on the screen, and that's led, of course, by all the IT heavyweights. So you have TCS, which has moved higher. Infosys, my, uh, still in the red, has recovered about a percent from the lows. We've seen a big, bigger move on Vipro and Tech Mahindra, both of them, uh, you know, well in the green currently and keeping the Nifty's losses just at around 40 points, taking it higher from the lows by about 240 odd points. So we'll keep an eye on the markets as we move along. Take a short break, come back, tell you a lot more about stock specific action on the other side. Stay with us. HDFC Bank has moved to the high point of trade, LNT doing well as well. So the IT index, HDFC Bank and LNT trying to pull together their weight on the Nifty. Reliance still in the red, but has seen a wee bit of recovery. In fact, Reliance from the lows has recovered about a percent still in the red by about a quarter of a percent. So let's see how these pan out. Uh, on the way down, however, we have Nestle, which is among the top losers on the Nifty in today's trading session. Of course, this is barring Axis Bank, which is down 7%. Nestle is down 3%. And that's on account of numbers that came in today itself. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's been a weak set. Uh, the revenues were lower than street expectations at 4,800 crores versus expectations of around 5,100 crores on the top line. EBITDA coming in at 1,100 crores. Again, the street was working with a number of 1,200 crores and margins as a result of which, along with the bottom line, below expectations. What was bad was the domestic volume growth came in at just 1%. The street was working with a number between 4 to 6%. And the revenue growth for the domestic business came in at 4%. Most on the street were hoping for a double-digit revenue growth. The reason why Nestle, you know, is falling a lot more than all the others is because, one, remember, you know, 75% of the company's revenue comes in from urban India. So the rural recovery theme that everyone's playing in FMCG may not apply entirely to Nestle, even though there would be a pos positivity, but that would be just to the 25% of their portfolio, as against, uh, you know, for others where nearly 40-50% of their revenues do come in from rural India. The second part is raw material headwinds are ahead. We've had Manisha come here and talk day in, day out about how coffee prices, cocoa prices are at record high. So going forward, those headwinds would keep, uh, you know, margins or margin expansion limited for the company. And finally, because Nestle had earlier outperformed all the FMCG peers when it came to growth, because it wasn't as impacted on the way down by rural weakness, the stock was trading at around 70 times their 525 earnings. And if you compare that to all the other FMCG peers, which have been underperformers, you know, it looks like there has been a bit of a valuation premium as well, which needs to come undone or moderate a little bit. So as a result of which the stock is, uh, despite having underperformed over the last couple of months, is down 3% post-week numbers. Okay, all right. Uh, that's on Nestle. That stock is down around 3 odd percent. We'll take a short break now. But on the other side, in our commodity segment, Manisha Gupta will be talking uh, to the head of La Platinum Guild International. Stay tuned. Welcome back and joining us on the show now is Vaishali Banerjee. She's MD India, Platinum Guild International. Vaishali, hi, good to have you. Uh, while so many things happened in the budget, but Platinum clearly also got a push with 15.4% to 6.4% of a duty cut that we saw. Your initial reactions to this? Hi, Manisha. Lovely to be here, as always. Yes, we are really, we really welcome this duty reduction. We are very pleased. I want to thank the government for it, really, because this will enable uh, the industry to progress, to grow. The demand is robust, but this will really catalyze it. You know, I think there will be um, increase in plant and jewelry footprint and everything else that goes with uh, rising demand at an industry level. Uh, more opportunity for people, jobs and uh, a sustainable growth in the future. Mm. But Shali, what is it, the kind of demand growth that India sees right now in sense of jewellery buying when it comes to platinum? How has that worked out in the last few years? And especially with this duty cut, are you expecting a spike in this? Yes, definitely. We do expect a spike. 
because uh, you know the demand has been growing year on year. It's been quite robust. Every year we grow between you know anything between fifteen to twenty percent at a fabrication level, slightly above that at retail. And now what this will do is make platinum even more accessible. You know the price is very consumer friendly already, and now it will mm. make it even more accessible. And I think so the entire footprint and uh, just the appeal of platinum can get uh, broader. So definitely we're expecting uh, this to boost demand in the coming season and going forward. Mm. Vaishali, because of the price decline or because of the uh, tax decline, what is your sense as compared to last year? Because we are getting into the wedding and the festival season as well, what is the demand that you were in any case working with and how much have you seen an increase now with the duty cut? So, you know, we are looking, uh, we are really looking forward to the season. We are quite bullish. We've got we've got great ideas lined up ahead, uh, you know, across all our brands. We've uh, got very interesting new ideas. You know, we've uh, got uh, MS Pony signature collection and uh, Men of Platinum. I think this is the first for the industry, so it should be um, uh, it should help us really boost demand. On on the top of that, now with the the declining uh, duty, which will make the price even uh, mm -hmm. better than it is currently, it will just widen demand and i think we are looking at at least an 18 to 20 percent growth in the coming season oh that's a big one but also yes it's uh, a big one <laughs> It is. Vajali, also when it comes to India, and we do understand that whatever platinum came into India in all of 2023, uh, that we, we saw that kind of an inflow in a month, and there was that was because of the kind of distorted duty structure that India also saw. Would you, would you say that all of that now with this duty cut has been taken care of? I think so. I think that, you know, those kinds of things which get in the way of just doing business and uh, could be quite disruptive. I think that this kind of duty structure should uh, really address those challenges. Vachali, hmm. also when you look at the international markets, we are working with a big deficit yet again for this year as well. And while jewelry is 30% of platinum demand, it's about automotive, it's about electrics, it's also about EVs where we do see a lot of industrial demand in sense of uh, platinum coming from. Uh, I, are you looking at this 30% grow anytime soon? Well, we don't know if the contribution will grow, but what we are looking from a jewelry point of view is to keep the jewelry demand quite robust. And mm -hmm. we're doing this across markets. There are there are uh, you know plans across each of our uh, markets where we operate. We are also looking at new region. Uh, we've just introduced uh, the program into the Middle East. Now that is going to be entirely incremental demand, which should uh, support jewelry. Um, consumption of the platinum going forward. So while this is just a startup market now and we're uh, testing waters, but it already has been quite positive in its response to uh, platinum jewelry. So like this, we are looking at new opportunities or even new segments to ensure that the jewelry demand remains uh, robust. Okay. Okay, all right. Thanks, uh, Manisha, as well as Vaishali, for taking us through that conversation. We need to take a short break, but we'll be back with more. Stay tuned.